So hello, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome to our inaugural Technology Earth webinar series here at Triple Ring Technologies. Uh, I'm Sheila Hamami. I lead the Environment and Sustainability Group here at Triple Ring, and I'm speaking to you from our office in Boston, Massachusetts. Triple Ring's longstanding mission is to improve human health through uh, innovative technologies. And I think we all now recognize that human health is completely intertwined with environmental health and planetary health. So applying our capabilities to a healthy planet is really a, a natural extension of our mission for us. So this new Technology Earth webinar series uh, is, has been created to convene world experts and technologists working on a variety of environmental challenges uh, to frame the problem, frame the challenges of scale up, and to discuss some viable solutions. Uh, our goal in doing this at Triple Ring is to connect individuals and groups working in these problem spaces with the innovation ecosystem that we work in that has really successfully delivered so many life-changing solutions in the biotech space. So our series is starting in the ocean, as you can tell from my background. Uh, and today we're going to hear about technologies for restoration and preservation. I'm thrilled to introduce our three speakers for today. Uh, Miles McGonigal is joining us from Miami, Florida. Miles is the lead engineer at Seacore International, and he's an engineer working in the coral space. So he's going to introduce us to uh, the general problem of coral restoration and preservation, and especially the scale of the problem. Uh, after Miles, we will hear from Dr. Mary Hagedorn. Mary is Senior Research Scientist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute and also at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, Mary leads her team as the world experts in preservation of coral species, effectively biobanking coral. And she will share with us both the science and the technology that she applies in doing this. So Mary is coming at this as the perspective of a scientist who's working with engineers to develop and deploy cutting edge biotechnologies. Our last speaker will be Dr. Pete Moralia, who's going to be speaking about work that he and I did together while we were at Draper here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And next month, Pete will be joining uh, the Sausalito-based organization, Revive and Restore, which is a not-for-profit that is dedicated to bring biotech to the field of conservation. Now, while Mary's work deals with eggs and embryos, Pete is going to talk about the other end, uh, ensuring that little corals that are grown in nurseries really have the best chance to become a permanent part of the reef. And the way that they become a part of the reef is through adhesives. So Pete's going to give us an example of bringing in sort of heavy hitters on the science and the engineering side to significantly enhance the current state of the art in terms of what's being done in restoration. So each of our speakers is going to talk for 15 minutes and we'll then go to q and I would ask everybody to please put your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll make sure that we work through those. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand things over to Miles McGonigal, please. All right, thank you, Sheila. You can see my screen. Okay, I read your lips. You said, yes, we can. Um, so. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining today. Um, my name, as, as Sheila mentioned, is Miles McGonigal. Um, I've taken a little bit of an interesting path to get to where I am. Uh, I am from Kansas originally, worked in water and wastewater treatment for quite a while, and now I do tools and technologies for coral reef restoration with Seacore International. And so what I'm going to do for you to do with you all today is frame a bit of where our coral reefs are at and how restoration is done currently, um, how CCOR uh, approaches restoration, and then also some uh, work with the Coral Restoration Consortium's engineering and innovation working group that I take part in as well. Um, and I'm also going to do a bit of an intro here, just assuming that not everybody knows exactly where we are in this coral restoration space and where our reefs are. So. Um, I apologize if I'm, I'm repeating anything that people already know, but just want to get us all on the same page here. So this is a picture of a healthy reef, we would say. Um, but unfortunately, we've lost over 50% of real reefs worldwide and at least 80% in the Caribbean. So they end up looking more like this. And this is expected to rise to 
75% by of 75% loss by 2050 worldwide and a complete functional loss in the Caribbean, which is just horrific. It's scary because our coral reefs are incredibly valuable. Um, they're these ecosystems that take up 1% of the area of the ocean, but they provide habitat for 25% of the species. They provide income and protein sources for people worldwide and protect our coastlines, prevent flooding for our cities. So we need to make sure that these ecosystems can survive the current stressors while we as society figure out how to combat climate change. The United Nations has gone as far as to declare this the ocean decade, um, just stressing the importance that we need to do something about our reefs within this decade to make sure that they can be around for our kids to see them. There's initiatives such as CORDAP, which is a G20 initiative launched to fast track um, and uh, solutions for saving the world's corals. But how do we do restoration? Um, and, and I'm gonna give a, some pretty simple, simplistic definitions here. So um, the way that I look at it, the way that uh, it is that there's two types of restorations. There's fragmentation or asexual propagation as, a, as one method of restoration, which in this case, it's taking a coral species, this is a, a branching coral, it could be a boulder coral, and fragmenting it, and so breaking it off, creating a genetic clone of that individual and planting it in the area we want to do our restoration. And organizations right now will typically build these, um, these coral trees where they hang fragments of coral on there, let them grow out to a point that they're large enough and fragment them off, take it to the outplant site where they're gonna have to do site preparation, which is scrubbing off the bottom of the ocean for that, those turf allergies, those things that are going to outcompete that coral or, um, and then use some sort of an adhesive as we're gonna hear about later. Um, a, a typical adhesive is a two-part epoxy or concrete to attach that fragment of coral to the ocean floor so that it will eventually grow out into a colony and populate that area. And so we're able to outplant a sizable amount of coral, but it is an incredibly labor intensive process. The largest bottleneck that exists no matter what coral restoration method you use is the amount of labor that goes into these efforts. The, the other mode of uh, coral restoration that I'm going to touch on is coral larval propagation, where we take advantage of the coral's life cycle, capturing um, the gametes, which are packets of egg and sperm that these coral will release. Um, they will be fertilized, then they will settle back onto the reef, onto a substrate, to then become mature spawning adults. And as a restoration process, we have divers out in the water collecting the gametes as these coral are spawning. They, they, we assist in the fertilization process, settle them on artificial substrates, and then outplant them onto the reef. And so right now, the, the largest scale projects for restoration that occur, no matter which method you use, is at this hectare scale. If we want to do anything to actually combat the devastation that's occurring, we need to be considering scales of up to square kilometers. And I, I, I want to stress here and point out that we would never do restoration in a gigantic square like this. This is, it would probably be patches along this reef, but this is to show the magnitude of the work that we need to do and we need to scale up our efforts to be able to get enough coral on the reef to actually make a difference. So, as I said, I work for Seacor International, where we have the mission of creating and sharing tools and technologies to sustainably restore coral reefs worldwide. And we do this through a surprisingly unique process. Um, we, we approach it at, from an inter, interdisciplinary uh, view, seeing, taking our biological research, technology development, and implementation matching them all together within our organization to upscale restoration. 
And so we have, and, and I'm coming to you today from that, that technology arm here. And so we have a, a, a team of renowned coral ecologists that are focused on the scientific research, the ap applicable methods to uh, for coral breeding and rearing. And I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention, of those two restoration methods that I mentioned, the, the fragmentation and the larval propagation, we primarily focus on larval propagation of coral um, as a restoration method. And so our scientific science team is, is focused on understanding better how that larval propagation functions, how those corals spawn, um, how we can support them as they grow into mature spawning adults. And they feed that information to me in this technology wing where I'm looking at the designs and manufacturing and logistics of getting those technologies into our science team's hands. But not only into our science team's hands, because the other arm of our organization is implementation. That we have a partner network that where we bring on organizations throughout the world. Um, and on a five-year time scale, we are teaching them how to use our methods how to set up in their and, and apply these methods in their local area, um, supply, helping to get them the tools and, and that they need to be able to make this work happen. And at the end of those five years, we hope that they are then able to teach others how to do this work. And, and so these are, this is a, a map here of some of the partners that we work with, with um, Miami, Mexico, and Curacao being some of our main research stations. Um, but as you can see from this approach, it, it creates this beautiful feedback loop for me on this technology development side that I am getting input from our science team and I'm developing things to get into people's hands that they then give me feedback on and I'm able to iterate and revise and improve as we look towards upscaling. And so as I mentioned, we focus on that larval propagation of coral and so I'm gonna step through that larval propagation process again, focusing on some of the technologies that we develop and utilize within that space. So spawning for these coral, the, the reef building corals that we focus on happens only once a year. Um, and so it's a very, we have a very small window that we have to be ready to perform these activities in. And as I said, we send divers out to collect the coral spawn with these incredibly high-tech devices. It's um, you know cones of fabric with a plastic funnel and a collection cup on top. But this is a, an example of a technology that you know, was created in people's basements and is, is really, in my opinion, the epitome of the definition of how coral restoration is done currently, that we, we do it with PVC and zip ties and it works for a season or two or three, but then we have to rebuild it and redo it. And while it functions, that is not going to allow us to scale these activities. And so this is something that I'm working on trying to develop manufacturing partnerships or, uh, and primarily right now, it's developing different designs that maybe make these more functional, long lasting and more efficient. Once the larvae has been collected, it is taken back to the laboratory for that assisted fertilization process. And this is a, a big part of where our science team has come in and we have uh, best practices for all the different species that, of coral that we, function, that we work with. Once that fertilization has occurred, we will introduce the embryos into uh, these floating mesocosms um, that we call cribs. Um, they're, they're designed to be able to be deployed out in the, on the open water so that they're stable, all they need to do be is anchored or moored in a certain area. And we introduce the embryos in there where they're gonna then their next life stage is settling on to substrates. Um, and and these, these cribs are another example of one of the technologies that we've developed for this specific application. Um, and those substrates are what we call seeding units. Um, those coral in their, their natural life cycle process are going to go down and settle somewhere on the reef that they're gonna call home for the rest of their life. In this case, we present to them only these seeding units, which are, they're about the size of your fist. I've got one right here on my camera, if you can see it. Um, and they're uh, made out of ceramics and concrete right now. 
And here you can see a little baby coral settled onto those units, all those little flecks. That's you know, they're the size of a grain of salt. Little itty bitty baby coral, baby coral. After they have settled onto these units, we send our divers out, and these units are those seating units are designed to um, hopefully be retained once we put them out on the ocean floor. We put them into the cracks and crevices on the reef, um, hoping that they're going to grow out there. But we see these seating units as an option uh, to reduce that large bottleneck that I talked about earlier of the amount of human uh, labor it, it just involved in, like inherent in this process currently. Because by just wedging them into those cracks and crevices, we're, ultimate, we're removing that adhesion step of the equation. And this is another example of where we would like to take this a step further and get to some mode of bulk out planting. Think of a farmer just tossing seeds into his field, sowing the seeds. And so some sort of bulk out planting that we could design, that we had a design of these units that functioned in that manner. And then so with that ultimate goal of them growing out to this point that they're a mature spawning adult themselves. This, for example, is a seven year, in the, when this picture was taken, it was a seven year old coral that we outplanted. So while some of these technologies can be considered, you know, cutting edge, they're, they're relatively low tech. Um, but I also believe that it shows that there's a, there's a lot of room for growth within this space. This coral res restoration as an, let's, let's call it an industry, as a field, is it's still very new, very much in a research and development phase. And while it's at this R&D level, like, you know, it, it, I, as I showed in the beginning, we need to take it past that and scale it. Um, to these large scale levels that are actually going to be effective. Um, and so it's, it's really important that we start taking some engineered solutions into account to be able to scale this up. Um, and so I, I, I hope that highlights it in itself, just the, the importance and how we can build into that. Um, but so another example of a group supporting and building restoration to scale is the Coral Restoration Consortium which I support as the chair of one of their working groups. But so the Coral Restoration Consortium is, or CRC is a, is a high level community of practice that comprises its scientists, managers, restoration practitioners, educators that are all trying to work towards enabling coral reef ecosystems to adapt and survive. Um, and so I've got highlighted here the, the priorities that they focus on. Um, and so this, as a, as, a, as a whole, I think there's 11 working groups. One of those working groups, which is the one that I, I'm the chair of, is the Engineering and Innovation Working Group. And within this space, we, we envision uh, facilitating innovation for coral re reef restoration, hoping to connect practitioners and industry, um, which is something that is severely lacking at this point in time. And which I'm, I'm just so grateful for Sheila to giving me another opportunity just to say this on top of a mountaintop as much as possible. Um, but with this working group, we are still, again, in these infant stages and in developing the best way to even connect people. One of those ways that we currently utilize is the stakeholder meetings where we have presentations from innovators in the field um, that, that talk about what they are doing but also invite people to come in to talk about opportunities maybe for funding within this space or opportunities for collaboration of services that can be provided. Um, and so just a quick side note down at the bottom there on our website, um, there's a, a sign up, but all to uh, learn more about this or to participate in some of these meetings, but also recordings of some of the previous meetings that we have done. Um, but this also provides an opportunity for people to network with each other. With it between these two spaces, the practitioners, people putting the coral onto the reef, and industry, the people that can help promote the scaling of the of this practice. Um, we also, as a working group, aim to build these what we're calling innovation initiatives, um, which ultimately we hope are uh, things that help to spur these connections. Right now, our latest one is something we're calling Coral Tech which is aimed at being a, a catalog of um, maybe something that doesn't exist yet or 
things that are being developed or things that you can buy off the shelf that can be used for coral, coral restoration or would be beneficial for coral restoration. Um, and we, we're going to do that by categorizing them into projects, products, programs with different technology areas and restoration activities that they pertain to. But then if some of you all know NASA's technology readiness level, we're going to assign a maturity level to this. That we recognize there are a lot of things in this space that people would really love to have, but don't exist yet. And so as an opportunity for uh, people in industry to go out and say, I want to do something, how can I help? Or things that people have developed to a level that, God, this would be really great if we could get somebody to pick it up and help me develop a supply chain for it, but don't have the resources or know how to do that. Trying to connect people within those spaces. Um, so if you're interested in, um, this is, it is unfortunately still in beta. We're hoping to have it live within the next month or so. Um, so if you're interested in being notified about that, there's a, an interest poll down at the bottom of the slide there. Um, but this is an example of the vision that we have for this working group as a mechanism of connecting this problem space with engineers and industry that are out there. And so with that, I just want to thank you all for your time. And, and hopefully it was, you learned a little bit of something. Um, and as Sheila said, I think we're going to have some questions and answers at the end. But I'm happy to stick around. My email address is there as well if, you're, if you would like to reach out. But thank you again, Sheila, for the opportunity and for your all's attention. All right, Miles, thank you so much. And also, um, I'd like to say anybody, if you'd like to be connected with Miles uh, and the uh, Coral Innovation Group, please feel free to contact us at Triple Ring and we'll put you in touch. I'm going to hand things over to Pete now, who is going to use my audio, so I'm not going to mute. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, let's see, let me see if I can share this. Are we there? Yes, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. You can even see this. Up. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, thank you, Sheila, for this opportunity. Um, and, and it's just so great to see all the circles come together. Um, Mary, yes, uh, I thought Isocoric was crazy too, but um, sometimes you just have to try things and, and I'm glad we did it. And, and uh, it was really great to see this, the progress on this. So thank you for sharing. And, um, and a, lot of, a lot of what Miles talked about, I'll, I'll be touching on as well. Um, I'll be touching on the asexual portion of this. So adhesives, it's kind of a strange thing to talk about given everything we've just said. Um, we've got a large team here that have worked together, including with industry, with a company called Henkel, uh, one of the largest manufacturers of adhesives around the world, uh, and uh, NOAA, who, who participated in this and funded this work. Um, and again, this is something that Sheila and I started um, several years ago, uh, pre-pandemic, if any, anybody can remember when that was. And um, uh, a lot has happened in between. So this is really the latest on where it is, uh, where, where I think it's headed. So uh, coral restoration is a large scale problem uh, to solve on many fronts. And I think I agree with both Mary and Miles that, that we got to throw everything at this, uh, all in parallel. Um, we, yes, we need resilient species, but in parallel, we need to develop a way, a pipeline way to, to do large scale outplanting, uh, which is the farming part of this that, that Miles touched on. Uh, so how do we go from a single bat to single outplant, a single coral, uh, to which I would consider gardening, to uh, farming or aquaculture? Uh, from one hectare, and I didn't know what a hectare was either, which is 100 by 100 meters, uh, to tens to tens of thousands of hectares. Um, the Florida Reef Tract is, uh, is a good example, which is about 60,000 hectares, um, and we are down to single digits in terms of survival fraction over many years of, of decimation. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of work to do here. So, so that's, that's, that gives you a sense of, of scale even uh, in our own neighborhood here in the US, continental US. Um, there is the Mission Iconic Reefs, which is a, a $100 million scale project to restore 28, sorry, not 28 hectares, which is on the order of six or seven reefs that are very, uh, you know, iconic reefs. Um, on the right hand side, it really gives us a sense of what the problem we're trying to solve here in outplanting uh, and the technology we need. So I drew a little circle there uh, that, that describes what where we are in the US at the moment. Uh, and this data is a little, data is a little dated, 
Uh, but even if it's uh, only a few years old, it really tells the story. On the x-axis is uh, log scale for what it would cost to restore a hectare of lost reef, okay? And you can see the US circle there around a million dollars. And you can look at the survival rate of those restored organisms, and it's not very good. So the, the arrow tells us where we need to go. Now there's a lot of data here in between, and there's a lot of other uh, types of ecosystems that we'd like to restore, uh, but that gives you a sense of what's going on in the US. So if you look at um, one hectare, that is, that's approximately if we do, you know, if we space things out and, and as Miles said, we're not gonna do it one big square. Um, you're looking on the order of, you know, hundreds of thousands of corals that would go down. Um, and if you wanna look at the cost of that in the US, it's about, just multiply it by 10 or up, somewhere between 10 and 100. And that's between, you know, two, two and a half millions to $25 million to do one hectare. So it's, it's a really large cost. Uh, and you might ask, what is, what is the real bottlenecks here? So what we did um, together was we, we, you know, as engineers, the hardest thing to do is, is to A, listen to the entire problem that needs to be solved. And I, I'm not good at this either. And two, um, to restrain yourself by giving a solution immediately. So what that is, and that is what we try to do. We, we sent an engineer from Draper down to the Keys um, she swam and tried to do this restoration that uh, Miles has had described already. Um, you know, trying to float with natural buoyancy uh, with swells going over the reef and using tools and your hands to do the restoration. And a large fraction of this bottleneck that I'm going to describe to you is tied up in dive time. And it's basically human labor. Yes, there are a lot of fixed costs that can, can be also changed, but the biggest one here to, to attack is, is that dive time. So if you look at um, coral owl planting, this is a number of steps and we broke it down and you've got to clean the surface. You can do this by hand. There are automated ways to do that that you could consider, but for the moment, that's you know one to five minutes. Um, they use an epoxy, uh, which is kind of a, like a putty epoxy. Uh, we call, um, I think it's all fixed. But we'll, we'll get to that. And um, you mix it up and you can see them rubbing their fingers together. It's sort of like silly putty and you squish it down in two or three places. And if you're putting down uh, staghorn, um, which is asexually reproduced and you know, fragmented and broken and taken from a nursery, um, that'll take anywhere from um, dispensing one to a few minutes and then attaching one to five minutes. So you're looking at, you know, on the order of 10 minutes here to do this entire job for one coral. So you can see all of that adding up. And of course, there are a number of innovative, innovative approaches here that, uh, that C-Core is doing that could get around that as well. So like I said, you do all these things in parallel. Um, so that's, that's what's going on in the field. And your question is, can, you, can we break this model? And the first thing that automatically comes to mind is throw, you know, send in the robots, right? And, and you know, that's, where, that's where I went immediately too. But it turns out if you really want to do look at this and, and try to get to the next step, it really is how do we attack this more efficiently? Because no matter what we do, even if we have a robot, it's going to need to attach it. Okay. So we explored a number of ideas that I won't, won't repeat here, including a nail gun, um, for a better and, and a better underwater adhesive really jumped to the top. So we developed requirements with NOAA um, on what it would take, what, what, what is the real need here? And that's really getting to spending time, an adequate amount of time in the problem space before you go out and find a solution. So the basic requirements are, the attached time should be less than a minute. Um, it should have an initial amount of stickiness to it. So think of like, if you go to Home Depot and you buy that great stuff that's insulation and you can't get, get it off anything once you, it sticks to it, something like that. So that as soon as you push the coral down, you can walk away, it's gonna hold it. And then it'll ultimately cure on the order of 10 minutes. This should require minimal skill, minimal touch labor, um, attach and move on. In fact, do it in batches with, with teams of divers. Um, a, a couple of the nice to haves would be, it should be uh, negative buoyant, so it should sink. So that, that, that could be a problem if you think about it, if it kind of floats away or floats above you or gets in your hair. Uh, and it also must be biocompatible. So um, it can't be harmful to not only the coral, but also the ecosystem around it. 
So that's that's really the real need. And where do we go for the solution? Well, we started working on um, how do we meet these requirements. And um, at Draper, we have we have a brilliant synthesis chemist who likes nothing more than to play with adhesives in the lab. And uh, at, this, at the same time, Noah was placing a couple decks uh, that I'll, I'll describe as plan A and plan B. Uh, plan A was to look long-term and say, okay, let's find a, a, an underwater adhesive that is compatible with water so that it actually works only with water. So if you put it down, it'll get uh, a better bond, but also you're not gonna worry about it getting um, curing before you even attach it. Uh, and then there's plan B, which is us, which is to systematically find a commercial off the shelf solution to me that actually meet these requirements. And the practitioners have tried a lot of things. And what Noah would ask us to do is take a little different look at this, look at it a little more systematically as to what adhesives are really out there and what would be a good fit. So we started with 14 candidates. Um, and it, this included uh, all fix, which is what I was trying to remember. And we started really simple. We put these adhesives in a tension tester, which you see on the right. And we put it in a lap shear arrangement, which, which kind of forces the, the, uh, the adhesive to, to pull off itself in a shear fashion, which you might expect more underwater. Um, the, all these samples were attached underwater, a seawater uh, equivalent, and then, and then tested quickly in the open air. And what this really was is just a screen to figure out which thing, which <clears throat> let's find some winners here out of all of these, <clears throat> all of these candidates. And <clears throat> two or three jumped out the most. And these are these are these are all Henkel products. Uh, they, they were called Unibond, but these are like one minute, five minute epoxies. <clears throat> and on the left hand side of this of the screen on this chart here, you could see this initial tack. So let me just back up a second. The x-axis is cure time. And the y-axis is the strength, how much how much force that we have to apply here, and it's a goofy unit because it's normalized uh, per gram of adhesive, but that's <clears throat> you get a, a relative sense of how these things are playing out. Uh, you will notice that the all fix was at the bottom. Uh, you would need log scale on the y-axis to really show how any differentiation amongst these, but at, <clears throat> at about this line where my my mouse is, if you can see it. Uh, is the point at which it doesn't matter what you're using. It's almost like toothpaste. It doesn't matter if it cures. Within that time frame, nothing is nothing is is, is really bonding. It's just the friction of or the, the friction of of, this, of these two th things sliding across each other, with the adhesive in between. So we figured out that we got a couple winners here, and um, um, you know let let's take it to the next level. So um, the next level for us was. Uh, Kind of a hack job. What we decided to do was let's try to find the best of both worlds. We know that the the, the marine epoxy that Hankel produces has a maximum long-term bond, and we also know that the the one-minute epoxy has some very good initial tax. So we actually started mixing them together without telling anybody, and we got our, the best combination was like an 80-20 or 80-15, 85-15 mixture of those two. Um, because really the, the, the mission here was to try to find something that anybody could get their hands on. And even if you just kind of mixed it, you got a good, you, you, you achieved your requirements. So I call this epoxy alchemy. Uh, <clears throat> so that's where we, we left off until um, we got a nice connection with the company Henkel. And Henkel has sustainability goals, like many uh, major worldwide companies. And um, once they learned about everything that you just learned today, they jumped in with two feet and they became a very critical partner and they remain to remain so this day. Um, so they jumped in to help us out with developing a custom formulation, which I'll, I'll describe as 4270. Each of these adhesives have codes and they also supplied cost adhesives for live testing. Uh, that was the 4070 and 4090, these are standard products. Uh, and they also are serving as a supply for initial field testing to make available for the community. So let's talk about the results that we did at Draper and I'll get into where, where we are today. So in, in the great spirit of uh, you know, just-in-time engineering, we developed a rig, I'll call it. And this rig allowed us, allowed us to test these samples underwater in tension. 
and you can see um, kind of a you know a, a aluminum uni strut, uh, a big Home Depot bucket full of water, and um, uh, a, a string and pulley system to pull the sample from the tile substrate. And this tile was limestone. And uh, we also have very, another high tech. Uh, feature here, which is a, a, a solo cup that we would fill with water and attach it to the string and it would give you a load that we could, you know, obviously you can measure how much water you put into a cup. So we knew what the weight was. So this allowed us to uh, test both coral skeletons and live coral. Uh, we started with the skeletons first to give a, a relative feel for which, which one of these things would stand out. But the real test was uh, live coral and something we learned along the way very painfully is that in working with coral, you cannot let that coral see air for at least one, even a second. Uh, because what, if what happens if you do that is you end up with a mucus mess and a slime that you cannot, that, that will totally ruin your test results um, and ruin your day. So we learned to be very careful with the coral to keep it underwater the entire time. I also learned what it really is to be a program manager at this time, because this was uh, in Boston during the winter and during a pandemic. And I learned my value, which was if you have only two or three hours left of billable hours on this project, you get in your car and you drive to the lab to get these corals and you deliver them in a cooler in the back of your car. Um, the, the coral that we use was Oculina and we want to acknowledge Boston University's Les Kaufman's lab for letting us borrow these little coral corals for testing. So again, we tested three candidates, which were Loctite 4070, 4270, and 4090. And what we found was um, very interesting. So what you see here are two plots. The first plot is with the skeletons, so the, the dead coral skeletons. Um, and on the right-hand side is with the live oculana uh, coral. So that's live coral, coral on the right. And what we found was um, in all cases, the 4070 fared the most, fared, fared, fared the best. And the 4070 uh, got us to the maximum load, which was that entire solo cup filled with water, pulling on the, on the coral, uh, even after a couple minutes of testing time. And it held there uh, even well after the 15 minute one that we tested these the next day as well. So the, the submerged coral was the most, sorry, the, the live coral was the most interesting one because 4070 not only held the best, but we figured out why is because the 4070 actually um, provide good wettability. So it actually flowed around the, the live coral and uh, bonded to the, the coral itself. Uh, whereas the other ones were, were kind of, they weren't um, hydrophobic, but they, they kind of required a lot more um, attention and, and you know applying lots of lots of adhesive around it to kind of like rope itself in or, or pot it in there so in that sense the 4070 really required less less effort on anybody's part to um to just put it on and stick so we literally just put adhesive on the tile and then stuck the coral to it we didn't we didn't uh, you know attach adhesive to the coral initially at all um and all the coral survived um, just fine after being brought back to Les Kaufman's lab at PU. Again, get back in the car, get the pool in the car, get it back over there. Um, and, and they all still, they all survived. Now the toxicology this, on this is still in progress, I understand. But um, from that standpoint, we were very satisfied to see that um, they all survived. So that's what we found out. So we have, we have you know, the 4070 to 4090 really were the ones that, that stuck out the most. And I think 4070 is the winner. Um, and, for, and both of these adhesives are, have a cyano, it's always hard to say this, cyanoacrylate component to it, which is like, which is essentially super glue, okay? So a part of this epoxy, some part of the trick here is to get that initial tack and that little bit of addition of super glue in there does that for you. Um, and people have tried super glue, just 100% super glue, it doesn't work because you get that, it, it just cures so rapidly and you get a, a skin around it before you even get a chance to attach it. So this is kind of a nice combination of an epoxy and a, and a super glue together. Okay, in summary, um, we have the possibility of a large scale global use facility by Henkel. So they, they, this is a standard product and now we are in discussions with them uh, and they are in discussions with other uh, 
other foundations to find out how to get this to people in the field. Uh, we're going to present on this uh, at Reef Futures in September. Henkel will present this. Um, and um, the results are very promising. So, you know, even if plan A still comes along and we get field testing. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention Thank you, Sheila. This is, why, this is why she's standing next to me. Um, the field testing continues. So um, we're going to get it in the hands of people like Miles, Coral, uh, Coral Restoration Foundation, to do the field testing, to actually get these on uh, in their restoration, restoration efforts and see if it actually helps, if it actually does meet the requirements we put out. Yes, it works in the lab. Um, yes, it maybe works in an aquarium, but does it really work in the field? Um, and from what I've heard so far, it's been favorable. We, the, the biggest thing we were worried about is when you use these, these epoxies, they have a self mixer at the end of them. And uh, we were worried that, you know, even after a couple, couple squirts that the, uh, it would freeze up and it, and it hasn't done that. And it, yeah, we were surprised how well it worked. So all the all results are pointing in the positive direction. And I mentioned plan A before, which is, uh, you know, a, a water-based polymer uh, um, adhesive. Uh, we're calling this a muscle-based polymer. It's already, you know, it's, it's still in R&D and it's com approaching commercialization, but it'd be nice to have two options as well. So, um, so we're looking forward to hear more about that as well. And I'll just finish up with acknowledgement. So the Henkel team has been awesome. They're really just owning this and taking it to the next step. Um, again, thanking Les Kaufman's team for letting us borrow their coral uh, during a pandemic. And... Uh, CRF and CCOR for taking into the field. Thank All right, you. awesome. Thank you, Pete. Um, so I want to thank everybody, uh, Miles and Mary, and invite you guys back onto the video. Um, we we scheduled this till quarter after, and uh, I want to start off with some questions. And in particular, uh, we had two questions that came in uh, very much along the same theme, and then actually one of our uh, guests made, made some observations, I think, to in an anecdotal response. Uh, but the first round of questions is really around um, uh, how do any of the coral restoration solutions um, currently work with regard to the fact that reefs are currently degrading? Um, so are they adapting to the warmer temperatures? Uh, I know, Miles, you're putting things back out in the Caribbean. And Mary, you alluded to uh, helping the species adapt to climate change. So um, perhaps, Mary, you can, you can start with that. Give, maybe give a little bit more detail. And then, Miles, you can chime in as well. Yeah, I mean, I think people are really interested in solutions and technological solutions. And, um, you know, I think really we're at the very beginning of understanding how this works. And part of it is um, we did a thing called assisted gene flow, um, where we took cryopreserved coral that we had frozen with CCOR actually, um, and some of it was 10 years old in bio repositories. And we crossed um, Florida, um, Puerto Rico and Curacao sperm with fresh Curacao eggs. And so we made these crosses of Elkhorn coral that were not, they weren't genetically um, manipulated. They were just selective breeding. We brought those embryos to uh, Florida and, and reared them in captivity. We have hundreds of them now. And um, the Elkhorn coral in Florida are, there's only 300 genetic individuals left. And um, even though we have this amazing re resource of, of these assisted corals that could potentially, you know, um, help in Florida, they're not allowing them to go back into, into the water, even into like, say, a, a, you know, a, a land-based, I mean, a water-based nursery such as CRF. Um, so um, it's 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 a little bit frustrating for us because we responded to you know sort of the the call for technological advances, but then we had this human component that still needs to be addressed. You know how how willing are managers to try things that um, might be a little bit um, experimental? Um, and um, you know and I think Australia has had the same issue where um, their managers were, you know, conservative and, and felt like um, they couldn't put things that were um, too experimental back in the water, but they've changed, they've actually changed their minds in Australia, I think, because of the loss of one third of the Northern Great Barrier Reef um, during the bleaching event. So um, I think that um, hopefully we will get there as well. 
and be able to try some of these things out. You know, some things that happen normally in in the in the wild may be okay, um, but um, I think that um, we still have a ways to go with how we can try and help coral reefs in terms of um, even assist you know assisted uh, you know assisted breeding, you know, a, a selective breeding, which farmers have done for thousands of years, right? Or dog, we do it for dogs. So um, it's, I, I think there's, there's, there is some uh, stakeholder communication and, um, you know, partnerships that we need to develop at this point. So Miles, um, you want to share some of your observations and experiences with, uh, you know, you, you, you showed the, the one coral at seven years out. Uh, I'm sure you have other examples or uh, sort of best practices for ensuring that everybody that gets back out there into the water has the best chance for survival. Yeah, I mean, so ultimately, I think what Mary said is is the biggest point there is just that um, that that with permitting options to be able to get out those assisted bre assisted breeding corals. There's a lot of experience uh, experience and people researching into this, but getting them actually out into the water is a different story. Until then, using techniques like larval propagation, each time a new one of those babies is fertilized and turns into an embryo, that's a brand new genetic individual with the potential to have genetic mutations that could be more resilient, could be more better suited to that environment they're being put out into. And so until that point, we have to rely on, on nature doing the best that it can. Um, but yeah, I think the, the ultimate answer is recognizing that if we want coral to be around, this is a practice that's done elsewhere. Um, we need to get all on the same, like that public opinion about that needs to change. And I think that that's one observation that we made repeatedly, uh, not just in the coral space, but generally in the technology for the environment space, that um, actually the you know, the, the technology challenges, no matter how, uh, how big they are, ultimately turn out to be on the order of 10% of the problem. And 90% of the problem is making sure that the entire community is on board uh, and that, uh, you know, permitting and, and sort of ensuring that uh, the rising tide raises all boats and that, that people are on the same page so that we can all get together going forward. Um, so we have maybe about five minutes left on the, uh, the time. Perhaps one of you can, uh, there, there was an observation made in the Q&A uh, about a, a project in Kuwait uh, with coral uh, growing on freshly uh, placed materials underwater uh, with new seeded colonies within two years. And just thinking about what's going on in the Middle East, uh, I understand that there are coral species there that are significantly more tolerant to substantial temperature swings. And um, Mary, you know, you had mentioned uh, crossing the same species from different areas around the Caribbean. Uh, do you think we'll get to the point where people are willing to try picking up coral from one area of the world? And Miles, you're laughing, moving it somewhere else. Boy, that's a that's a big no. Yeah, no. There, there's there's too many issues with. Um, well, I mean, remember that corals are colonies and colonies of lots of stuff, right? So they 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 could have disease. They they could have worms. They could have different algaes. I mean, they are just like floating ships. I mean, they're ships, really. And so, um, in, in fact, the AZA um, that has the two thousand coral colonies in captivity are not going to ship any of the colonies. They're not. Think of them as elephants. They're going to ship cryopreserved sperm, and so the need to um, and you know our, our technology for cryopreserved sperm is excellent. We have over fifty species that we have um, we have cryopreserved worldwide, and um, lots and lots of samples. And so, and you know we're training people in it. You know you can do a three D printed freezer rack. It's up on our website. Um, so shipping sperm and um, you know and having corals crossed with, with um, frozen sperm is the way they will do it. Um, you know, there's that, that brings up a lot of genetic issues, but I think that, that can be resolved with group management. And um, uh, also, you know, the use of these ex situ reproduction um, centers that Jamie Craig's developed that are fabulous, you know, um, 
the Florida Aquarium is doing an amazing job, as well as many other places around the, the world. But Florida Aquarium, which is part of the AZA, is really le leading the charge on this because they've taken the pillar coral that was doing so badly in the wild in Florida, and they've gotten them so they're really healthy. They have good reproduction and good re reproductive metrics now, and they've used cryopreserved sperm to make new embryos. So I think the technology for frozen sperm is, is doing well, and um, we, we will not ship corals around the world. We will ship either embryos or frozen sperm. So um, Miles, you talked a little bit about the, the working group. Mary, you certainly mentioned um, all the aquariums that have been involved in this. Uh, and Pete, you've interacted with quite a few um, entities in different sectors. So maybe what I'd like to do is, is end with the question, um, you know, I think there, there are a lot of people on this call who are technologists that perhaps are divers or are interested in stepping up for the planet, Mary, uh, answering some of your calls. What is the best way for um, an engineering team, a small company, or an individual uh, who brings some technical skills to the table but is not a coral or marine expert uh, to learn more about unmet needs and to get connected with uh, coral experts and, and tech end users, um, going beyond uh, reaching out to uh, the CRC coral tech or working with uh, uh, the aquaria. What are some starting points for people? Ooh, if we're if we're going beyond the CRC and coral tech, that was going to be my answer to that question. Yeah, that's okay. You, you can repeat it's, it, Miles. <laughs> but 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 ultimately, it's that is one of our large challenges: is how do we connect these people that want to help with the people that need the help? And that that is one of our big goals with Coral Tech is providing a a, a resource where people can express you know what could be done or what they need to be done. And others can provide, you know, some sort of support to be able to work with them and, and try and build some collaborations from that. And it, from my, in my opinion, part of it is going to be working with the restoration community to express to them how beneficial it could be to work with engineers, to work with people within industry because of the benefits that it can provide. Recognizing, like helping people to understand that PVC and zip ties works great for prototyping, but we can't use that as a long-term solution because we need to put our focus on getting corals out, not on repairing what we need to get the corals out. Um, and so I think it's within that space, it's education about understanding what engineering could provide to this industry, um, which is what I really hope can you know, grow and foster within that engineering working group and, and, and innovation and things like Coral Tech to be able to connect people. Okay, thanks, Miles. Pete, can I give you the last word? Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. Yes, uh, I, I, so I, I agree, and I think that um, everything Miles said is, is is right on. And, and I think what I'll share is just is just the mindset. If you if you are an engineering type or a technology type, it, it's so hard to to listen and try to get into that problem space to figure out where where you can help and be, before offering a solution. I think. Um, as you, as you go through that process, you'll learn that yes, okay, um, there is this problem, but there's also many, many layers to it. So even the simple question of, can I, can I mix species? It seems very logical, but, but, um, but there, there's, there's a number of rules and, and, and hidden rules behind everything here, because it, these, these things are not just one species. There's a whole entire ecosystem that is interdependent and, and has a lot of rich, complex things that make things great. So I think, um, yeah, I'll just I'll just repeat that it's really important to try to learn as much as you can, try to ask pointed questions and, and listen and, and uh, see where you could fit in. All right. Well, with that, yes, Mary. All right. I wanted to just say one last thing, and that was we have very limited time, and we. <laughs> engineers and biologists must work together. And so if you have any interest or any passion for this, just contact us. We'll, we'll figure out how to make your contribution worthwhile. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody, thank our panelists very much for their, their contributions to the coral space and their willingness to share with all of us today. I want to thank all of you that joined us. And for anybody who wants more information or more uh, you know, connections, introductions, by all means, reach out to us at Triple Ring. Um, 
you know, use the use the uh, the web form. I will make sure that you get connected with the right entities and the right people, um, because as Mary says, um, you know, we need all of us working on this to to move move forward together. Right. And um, thanks to everybody, and uh, we'll convene again, um, hopefully next month, uh, around uh, another topic. So take care, everybody. Bye.